Well, I told you uh, last week that we were going to do communion today, and we've actually put communion off for one more week. Next week, I'm going to teach on the blood of Christ, and uh, we will do communion uh, along with that. Uh, Today, I have a a word I want to share with you, but before we do that, uh, I thought we would do some family jokes, and these jokes have nothing to do with what you just witnessed, absolutely not. Um, You'll understand why I said that when I read the first one. Little boy said that his brother thinks that he's smart, thinks he knows everything. And and he said that uh, my brother thinks he's so smart that he told me that onions are the only food that makes you cry. So I got a coconut and threw it at him and hit him in the head. A child asks his father, how were people born? And so the father explained to him, well, uh, Adam and Eve had babies, and their babies grew up, and they had babies, and their babies grew up, and they had babies, and so on and so forth, and that's how it works. And so the child then went to his mother and said, uh, asked the same question, how are babies born? And the mother said, well, we were monkeys, but we evolved to uh, become like we are now. And so the little child ran back to his dad and said, you lied to me. And the the father said, no, your mom was only talking about her side of the family. (laughs) All right. Enough. Enough. Who came for the Bible today? Who came for the Word of God today? All right, we want to get right into it. Listen, I hope and pray that from last week's message, your prayer life has been transformed by the fact that the power that is in the name of Jesus comes from the very resurrection of Christ from the tomb. And I trust that your prayer life has been transformed, revitalized, revolutionized by the power that's in that name, the name that is above every single Uh, name that is named on the earth. Today, we are going to teach and share a message on the word go. Go. Now, everyone likes to go. I mean, who prefers a red light to a green light? Anybody? You pull up to an intersection and you're so, so discouraged when you see that it's green. I don't think any of us get that way. How many of you prefer a line to no lines? Anybody here at all? Does anyone like a locked door versus an unlocked door when you're trying to get in? No, we all like go. We all like to be on the move. The word go is in the Bible 1,542 times. The word stay is in the Bible 62 times. So there's quite a disparity. In the Old Testament, the word go means to pursue a goal. Pursue being the operable word. In the, in the New Testament, the word go means to move over, to move above, and to move beyond. So really what this word go is, speaks of is movement. It's, it's actually talking about us going from where we are to where we want to be. Having said that, I'm going to begin today by teaching and talking, first of all, about staying, about not going, because it's important for you and I to know that in order to go, we've got to learn to stay. Oh, you're going to learn something today. You're going to get some help today in your life. We've got to learn to be anchored in the storms that come our way, because storms hit all of us. Storms come our way, and we've got to learn to be anchored when the storms come, so that when they pass, and they do, storms always pass, when they pass, we are ready to go. So let's begin then, first of all, with staying, with being anchored. A storm as we approach Acts 27, is threatening to sink a ship that the Apostle Paul is on. How many of you have been on those ships before? I'm not talking about literal ships, but 
the storms of life, threatening to sink you. Well, Paul is on a literal ship. The storm is threatening to sink that ship. And we pick up here in Acts chapter 27, beginning at verse 17. Now, when they had taken it on board, they used cables, talking about water, talking about the storm. They used cables to undergird the ship. The way they did it in those days is divers would have to dive down underneath the the, uh, ship and swim with these cables and attach them to the other side. And on those cables, then, they they would have the anchors. And so how many of you want that job? Nobody that I know of does. When they had taken water on board, they used cables to undergird the ship. What were they doing? They were anchoring it, fearing lest they should run aground on the uh, uh, citrus sands. They struck sail and were so driven. Verse 18, and because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. And on the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Now, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. Let's read on. Let's read through the rest of this this verse, uh, through this chapter, uh, to, to, to verse 29. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. The Apostle Paul is speaking. For there stood by me this night an angel of the Lord, to whom I belong and to whom I serve, saying, don't be afraid, Paul, you must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. How many of you know when you're in a storm, it's good to be with somebody who knows God? It's good to be with someone who has a relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe, uh, God, that it will be just as it was told to me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Now, when the, fa- when the 14th night had come, how many of you know that's a long storm? As we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land, and they took some uh, soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. Then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. Father, thank you for your word today. It's a privilege for us to approach it, to to teach it, to receive its instruction into our life. It's important for us today, many who are here, to hear this word of the Lord for their lives, for their businesses, for their families, for their children, their grandchildren, for the plans and purposes you've placed before them. This word is important. And I pray that they will receive in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There are three things that we see out of this passage of Scripture that that talk about being anchored, being grounded, staying in the middle of a storm. And the first thing that we see is found in verse 17, and it is this, brace yourself. Brace yourself. When you're in a storm or about getting ready to face a storm, brace yourself. When I was a little boy, we'd go down to the beach. I lived about 20 minutes from the beach, and so we'd go to the ocean, and uh, we'd, we'd get into the water, and those waves were 30 feet high. Well, at least they seemed that to me at the time. They're actually probably about three or four feet high. But you would see the swells coming, and, and, and you, you wanted to get to a place where they would crash on you. How many of you remember those days when you were kids? And so, but you'd have to brace yourself, because you know that when it hit you, it was going to send you straight under or send you flying. So you would brace yourself. And one of the most important things that you and I can do, knowing that all of us will face storms in our life is to always be prepared, to brace ourselves. And that's what we read in verse 17. They brace themselves for the, for the storm. Then the second thing that we see here is, is found in verse 22. 
when Paul says this, go there to verse 22. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. When storms come, it messes you up in every way, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And Paul says in the middle of a storm, take heart. One translation says, cheer up. And that's the second thing we have to remember in a storm is to cheer up. Really what it's saying is this, control your emotions. In a storm, make sure your attitude is right. So many people live their life built and based around the fact that they are a victim of everything that's happening to them. We said this last week. It's not about what happens to you. It's about what has already happened for you on the cross, the empty tomb. Christianity, the message of Christianity is one of victory. The message of Christianity is not depression and despair and trials and tribulation. Some people, when you talk to them, all they want to talk about is the trial they're going through, the tribulation that they're experiencing. But the truth of the matter is the message of Christianity is one of victory. So cheer up. Cheer up. That's what Paul said to do. Take heart. And then the third thing that we see in the storm, we find back in verse 18, is that there comes a point when you've got to lighten your load. You've got to lighten your load. And that's number three. I I love the fact that it says in verse 18, use your own hands to lighten the load. Get, Get rid of that which is non-essential in a storm. There, there are things that, that you've got to lay aside so that you can get to the heart of the matter. Why should your financial status be in jeopardy by you squeezing on to things that really don't matter? Why should, should your marriage suffer and be in ruin Because you want to hang on to the non-essentials. What the Bible is saying in a storm, if you're not anchored, if you haven't lightened your load, if you haven't braced yourself, then you're going to be in trouble. When, When we are told to stay, to drop anchor, what it's saying to us is this, weather the storm because it's not going to last and if you can weather the storm and there's we just read three ways to weather it if you can weather the storm then what will take place is you can go you can go on to what's next I know that in my own life there are some things for me when I'm in a storm and I get in storms often I think the reason I get in storms often is because I, I try to take big steps for God. And whenever you take a big step for God, you're going to find yourself in the middle of a storm. And when, when, when I'm in the middle of a storm in my life, there are some things that come that I, I've got to grab hold of and throw overboard because if I don't, it'll wreck me. It'll sink me. One of those things is insufficiency. You ever been in a storm and and the enemy comes and he starts to tell you you don't have enough, you don't have what it takes, you don't have enough money, you don't have enough time, you, you, you don't have enough giftings. And what the Bible says to do is grab that bag load of insufficiency and throw it overboard. Sometimes the enemy will come and he will tell you uh, that that. It's a good time for you to be insecure in the middle of your storm. I can't, I won't, I'll never. Grab that bag of insecurity and throw it overboard. Often the enemy will come and tell you how insignificant you are. And you feel that way because in the middle of a storm, you, you feel so small. You ever felt like you were on the outside looking in? Anybody ever in, it just kind of felt so insignificant that it seems like everybody was on the other side of the glass? 
You ever, you ever felt like uh, you, you were just not in the in crowd? I'm the only one. I guess I am not in the in crowd. What a revelation this morning. Here's what the Bible says. Brace up. Everybody say it. The Bible says, cheer up. The Bible says, lighten up. All of these things are designed to help you stay. Be anchored in the storm. Because God knows that storms don't last. And he also knows that ships are designed to go. He knows that your life was designed to go. If you're in a storm this morning as we speak, know this, you were designed by God to go, not to sink in the storm that you're in today. The reason that we stay is so that we can go. So let's, let's do in Scripture what we're here for today, and that is to go. Luke chapter 9, I want to begin at verse 57. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. Now, our introduction was that we've got to stay in the storm, and the reason that we do it is so that we can go when the storm passes. If you feel like you're still in the middle of the storm, uh, just, just wait. It, it, it's going to go. But you need this next word because you were designed to go. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. It's important to know that there's a go that follows another go. I'm a go. And I follow another go. His name is Jesus. And wherever he goes, I go. And Jesus said, Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And he said to another man, Follow me, or let's go. But that man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. So this man has an excuse as to why he can't go. Verse 60, so Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. When you read this verse, it seems like Jesus is either having a bad day or uh, he's a little bit insensitive. He needs to work on his people skills. Um, but the point is that, that there is never going to be the perfect time or the perfect circumstances to go. The point is not to reject your family and to not honor your, your, your uh, father or your mother. That's not the point. The point is there will never be a perfect moment, a perfect circumstance, a perfect time to go. When it's time to go, you got to go. When it's time to move, you've got to move. Verse 61. Still another said, I'll go, but first, let me go backwards. I've got to say goodbye to my family. Here in verse 60, we see another excuse. Uh, 61, another excuse. Let me go back. Let me go backwards. Backwards and, and going have nothing to do with each other. Verse 62. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. All I want to do is go say goodbye to mama and papa. That's all I want to do. And again, this is not about mama and papa. What this is about is when it's time to go, you've got to go. There will always be reasons why you can't. That's the strong point that's being made. Anything I've ever done in my life of significance for the kingdom always puts me face to face first with go time. No looking back time. Joyce and I were recently having lunch with 
um, some pastor friends of ours, and um, they wanted to hear our story about our campus and our, our building. And um, when uh, we got done talking, uh, the wife turned to the, the, the husband and said, said, you see, we just got to step out and go because they desiring a building uh, of their own. We've got to step out and go. There's always going to be a go time. There's, there's a slow time. There's a anchor stay put time so that the storm can pass. But both of those things, slow and stay, are designed for go. They, they help you go. It's important to know that God is always, always going to end the conversation of your life, your purpose, your ministry with go. Now, let's see the practical steps of going. 2 Kings chapter 7, and I'm going to read verses 3 through 8, and as we read them, I'm going to share with you three practical steps of going. The setting here is that Israel is at war with Syria, and there's great famine in the land. And the first couple of verses talk about the fact that there's no food, and, um, uh, and so the man of God says, well, prices are going to go down tomorrow. And somebody says, well, you know what? God could open up the heavens and pour out all kinds of food, but that's just not going to happen. And so we pick it up here at verse 3. Now, there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. So there are four men who were on the outside looking in. They couldn't be around uh, people who were healthy. And they said one to another, why are we sitting here until we die? Why should we stay? We're going to starve to death. We can't go in. And, and the enemy is out there wanting to come in and destroy why should we just sit here and starve to death? Why should we just sit here and die? It was time for them to make a move. It was actually time for these four men to go. And so the first step to knowing when it's time to go is you've got to, number one, assess your situation. They did. They assess their situation. And here's what their assessment was. If we stay here, we're going to die. Complacency, lack of, of movement will kill you. It'll kill your promise. It'll kill your potential. It'll kill your purpose. We choose to stay in our present state because we don't know if going is going to produce the desired results. I've talked to people in, in business who, who always are faced at some point in their, their business life, in their employment life, with taking the next step. But the next step always requires much. And so, so if they don't, they never reap the rewards of what they really desire in their heart. But it's, a, it's a, a, a painful, scary thing to take a step beyond where you presently are in your spiritual life. It's the same way because it's going to take more from you. It's going to demand more of you to go into a new level of your relationship with Christ and your purpose for being on the earth by moving, by going. And so oftentimes people in assessing their situation won't be honest with themselves. These four were very honest. They said this, here's the situation. If we stay here, we're going to die. Verse 4, 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 4. If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city. We're going to die there with everyone else. If we sit here, we'll die as well. So 
Let's go surrender to the enemy, the army of the Syrians. They just might keep us alive. They might feed us a morsel. And if they do, we'll live. I know it's a calculated gamble, but if they kill us, I mean, we're going to die here anyway. So why don't we just go ahead and surrender? The time comes when you're out of options. And that calls upon you then to, number two, make a decision. Make a strong decision. I think it's good at times to be out of options. You ever heard the phrase, believe God or die? I think it's good sometimes to be out of options. I, I, my personality is such that I'm going to explore every option I have for as long as I can before I jump out. And when I'm out of options, I have to make a decision. My decision, hopefully, will always be to obey God and go. But you have to make a decision. Verse 5. So they made a decision. It was a strong one. And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. So they made this strong decision because they were desperate to go. And that go decision wasn't easy. These four lepers were going to surrender to the enemy with the hope that they might not die. And when they got there, the enemy was gone. Verse 6. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses and the noise of a great army. All it was were four lepers crawling to their destination to give up. And what the Syrians heard was a great army. How many of you know God had something to do with that? So they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Now they're starting to think crazy. Therefore, they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and they ran for their lives. Listen. When you go, it releases God to do things you don't even know he's doing. When you go, it allows God to do things behind the scene that you can't see. In my life, whenever I have gone, God has already gone before me. All he's waiting for to tie up the loose ends is to see me step out towards my destination. And once he does, he taps on the shoulder of a little lady and says, you go drive by a church you've never heard of and you've never seen. And when you get there, you go inside that building and you ask to see the pastor, and when you meet him over the next few years, you give him $3 million so he can build what I've asked him to build. See, God's doing things before you even go, but he's not releasing things until you go. And if you don't go, those things will go to somebody else. Because they went, God did something only he could do. 
And when you go, God goes before you. No go, there's no need for God to go. Did you hear what I said? You don't go, there's no reason for him to go. But if you do, it puts you in position for number three. To embrace what's next. I love verse eight. Just picture. Close your eyes for just a moment and picture these four lepers who had gone to the camp of the enemy to give themselves up, not knowing whether they're going to live or die. Now open your eyes and let's read verse 8. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent and they ate and they drank. And they took from it silver and gold and all the clothing they needed. And they went and hid them. And they came back. And they got some more. And they ate some more. And they drank some more. And they took it and hid it. And they came back. And they ate some more. And they drank some more. And they took some more. And they ate it. They drank it. They hid it. Verse 8 doesn't happen until somebody goes. How many verse 8's in your life never happen because you didn't go? How many verse 8's in my life never happened because I didn't go? Oh, that we would say to the Lord, I got all my bananas on your boat. I'm, I'm going. I had a little storm to weather. But I'm go. You know, at the end of this past week, um, we, you know, we've had a lot of different challenges to 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 get here, and um, uh, we're we're excited with the new year coming. What what God has planned for us, what we've planned to do to reach uh, our world, our community, to bring in the harvest. We're excited about all of that, um, and it's going to take all hands on deck. Um, but we weathered a storm that lasted a while. And in weathering that, that storm, uh, as, as we weathered it, uh, there were things that we had to do. And just like Paul on that ship and those men had to do. And yet the reason we did it was because we knew there would be a moment that was going to say, it's time to go. We knew that moment would come. And that moment, we're here and that moment is fast approaching us. And, and uh, all, it's going to require all of us to, to get involved and use uh, who God has gifted us to be. Uh, and, but we, we have to embrace it. We have to be willing to, to embrace it. And if we do, we are going to eat and we are going to drink. For me, the greatest meal I could eat is leading someone to Jesus Christ. The greatest drink I could have is to seeing somebody mature in the living word of God. I'm going to eat and drink until I'm fat and full and drunk of people who are coming to know Christ and are finding out who they are in him and are using their abilities and their giftedness to serve the Lord. I'm going to eat and drink to, to, till I am full. And then I'm going to take all of the gold and silver that I can and invest it in the kingdom. And I'm not just talking about money, but I'm talking about the gold that's in people and the silver that's in people. We're going to invest it into the kingdom of God. Uh, this, this, this last week, I mean, even on uh, Friday... Uh, we got some things that uh, need to be done before we get our final uh, approval to be here. I got news for you. We're here. It's final. But, don't know why I said that, but <laughs> our paperwork says you're, you're here temporarily. And um, so... Uh, you know, there's some things that have to be done, things we hadn't counted on, things that cost money. And and uh, on Friday, uh, having gone to the city uh, again and trying to get this thing taken care of and um, we're unable to get it taken care of and meeting after meeting, phone call after phone call. And, uh, you know, the bottom line is, I mean, there's just a lot of money 
that still yet has to be spent. And so I came back to my office and um, I sat down in my office Friday afternoon and I said, Lord, and as soon as those words came out of my mouth, I felt the big finger of God on my nose. Don't you start whining. (laughs) Don't you dare start whining. And I said, Lord, thank you for the resurrection power that's in your name. I said, Lord, thank you that the responsibility that we have to our community and the neighborhoods that we live in and the people that we're connected with, thank you that we are not going to stand idly by while the devil takes them straight to hell. We are going to share the goodness of God and his love and his grace. And you have never let us down. You're not letting us down today. And I want you in your life to leave here today with this confidence. That even though you've been through a storm or are in a storm or you've just come out of the storm and you are soaking wet. Whatever the circumstance and situation is for your life. Know this, God has something for you that is next, and the requirement will always be to rise up and go, to rise up and go. It may be about your health. It may be about something he's requiring you to do physically. It might be emotionally. God may call you to task for the way that you are always whining or being ugly because you have a right to because of what they did and what they said. God has a plan for you to go and he's going to give a verse eight to you as you go. But the requirements on what you do come first.